Hello, my name is Scott Burley. I work at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and this is the second lecture segment in our course on the ION implementation of the DTN architecture. In the first lecture segment of this course, we went through an overview of the delay tolerant networking architecture. In this segment, we'll get into a little bit more detail on uh, delay tolerant networking, uh, how it works, uh, and that's important to know in order to understand how ION works and what its uh, architecture is, uh, what its structure and functions are. Uh, and, and then we'll uh, do an overview of the core modules of the ION software product. In RFC 4838, which is the first RFC published on delay tolerant networking, an overview of the architecture. Uh, there is a line that sums it up saying, the architecture embraces the concepts of occasionally connected networks that may suffer from frequent partitions and that may be comprised of more than one divergent set of protocols or protocol families. That is a, an overlay that unites multiple networks that have their own network protocols and their own uh, network functionality. So how do we make that work? Of course, the concept that we're working with in DTN is not a totally new concept. It's very much like the architecture of the internet, except it's just one layer higher in the protocol stack. That is, the bundle protocol is designed to function as an overlay network protocol that interconnects internets, which could include both networks that are based on the internet protocols and also uh, data paths that utilize only space communication links. In, in much the same way that the internet protocol interconnects subnets or local area networks, such as those built on Ethernet, Sonet, etc. To help visualize this concept, here is a diagram of a typical uh, DTN protocol stack. At the bottom of the stack are uh, physical media, uh, radio, um, optical communication uh, wire, um, and just above those would be the familiar link layer protocols such as uh, 802.11 and Ethernet in the terrestrial domain. And in space communications, uh, CCSDS link layer protocols such as AOS and Proximity 1. Above that, uh, in the terrestrial portion of a DTN end-to-end -end path would be uh, TCP IP. Uh, on the space link portions of, of a path, would be potentially the lighter lighter transmission protocol that we'll be talking about a little bit later, uh, running on top of uh, encapsulation packets, which in turn are encapsulated within CCSDS link frames. Uh, it's above that that the difference really begins to show up. The one protocol uh, routing layer above the transport and LTP protocols is the mechanism that enables multiple environments to be connected together for enables a, a single piece of data to seamlessly travel from one end of the solar system network to the other. Uh, the bundle protocol layer, as we talked about in the last session, relies on um, convergence layer protocol adapters. The converse their protocols are things like uh, TCP, IP, LTP, and the adapters are the mechanisms that, that uh, em embed DTN bundles in the protocol data units of the convergence layer protocols. Above bundle protocol itself are applications. Uh, in this case, what we're showing is a couple of application services that are specific to the space operations domain. Uh, CC, CFTP is the CCSDS file delivery protocol. AMS is the CCSDS uh, asynchronous message system. And ab above those would be actual user applications that utilize those application services, such as a data manager. The data traversing a delay tolerant network uh, are conveyed in these DTN bundles, which are functionally analogous to IP packets, but a layer higher in the stack. They are carried between bundle protocol endpoints in the same way that IP packets are carried between 
IP endpoints, uh, which uh, typically are uh, sockets. So bundle, you can think of bundle protocol endpoints as being functionally analogous to sockets. Uh, a single bundle protocol node can communicate using multiple BP endpoints in the same way that a single IP node, such as a host or a router, can communicate using multiple sockets. Since the DTN architecture essentially echoes the architecture of the internet, you might expect the stacking of DTN protocols to be reflected in the structure of the protocol data units that are transmitted over the network in the same way that this is done in the internet. And in fact, that is the case. Uh, here we've, we've adapted this uh, diagram from the first uh, session of, of, of the course and added uh, one layer of protocol in between the application layer and the transport layer, adding a, a bundle protocol layer in the stack and showing where the convergence layer interfaces uh, in that in that stack. And that maps directly onto the structure of, for example, in this case, uh, a, a USLP uh, frame. A USLP is a CCSDS link layer protocol, unified space link protocol. Um, the USLP frame uh, has embedded in it and carries as its as its payload uh, an encapsulation packet, which has its own header. The encapsulation packet has as its payload an LTP segment, which has an LTP header. Uh, the LTP segment has uh, as its payload, in this case, a very small bundle that fits into a single LT LTP segment. The bundle has its own header and it has its own payload, the uh, CFTP file data segment in this case. Going into more detail on the structure of a bundle, here's a diagram that shows the blocks of any single bundle, the, the portions of, of, of a bundle are termed blocks. And the structure of a bundle in general is uh, very similar to the structures of protocol data units for lots of other protocols. There's a header at the beginning and there's content or payload uh, following the header. Uh, the bundle header comprises multiple blocks, uh, potentially. Uh, there's always a primary block and there may be any number of extension blocks immediately following the primary block. The last extension block is followed by the payload block. And the payload would be, for example, a, a CFDP file data segment, a remote AMS message, uh, a f uh, an entire file. The primary block, the first part of the header of the bundle, contains the uh, IDs of the source and destination endpoints, the source of the, of the bundle and the destination. Uh, it contains the bundle's time to live, uh, various processing flags, uh, class of service, such as uh, the priority of the data and, and so on. Extension blocks are, are designed to carry additional information that may be optional in some environments and may be required in others. Uh, the kinds of uh, blocks that we can expect to find in the extension block array between the primary block and the payload block would include things like security, the block integrity block, the block confidentiality block that I think we'll talk about those a little bit later in the, in the course. Um, there's an extended class of service block that, uh, it, that provides f uh, the flag for the criticality of a bundle and a couple of other class of service indications. Uh, there's a, an optional bundle age block for bundles that are generated at nodes that don't have uh, accurate clocks and can't provide a, an accurate uh, creation time. And there are a number of other extension blocks for various other purposes. Bundle protocol is designed for bandwidth efficiency wherever possible and expansion as necessary. So most of the fields in all of these blocks are variable length. They're designed to be only as large as they need to be to accommodate the data that they're carrying. And the extension blocks are uh, intended to contain all the information that might vary from uh, node to node as the 
as the bundle passes through the network, and also all the information that won't necessarily be required in every environment. In some environments, such as a, a laboratory exam, uh, environment, for example, you might not need security because uh, it might be a closed network. Uh, but in uh, operation over, uh, uh, over the solar system internet, you would want security on every bundle. Uh, the extension block mechanism gives you the flexibility to uh, have that uh, security um, block structure in place where you need it and omit it where you don't. Because bundles always need to be conveyed using the protocol data units of underlying convergence layer protocols, and those, in, those underlying protocols in some cases may have some constraints on the maximum size of the payload that any convergence layer protocol data unit can carry, we may sometimes find that a bundle's payload is so large that the entire bundle can't fit into the payload of a, an encapsulating convergence layer protocol data unit. When that's the case, we have a mechanism for fragmenting the bundle into two smaller bundles. Um, only the payload is fragmented. The fragments that result from, uh, from, from fragmenting the bundle are themselves full-fledged, completely routable, absolutely complete bundles that are processed like, uh, like the original bundle in, in almost all ways. Uh, the primary block of each fragment mostly is copied from the original bundle. There may be some, there have to be some differences because there's additional information in the primary block that identifies the segment. Um, fragmentary bundles are uh, themselves regular bundles. And so since bundles can be fragmented, the fragments can be fragmented. And so uh, in effect, this structure enables a single original bundle to be fragmented into any number of small fragmentary bundles that can conveniently be encapsulated in convergence layer protocol data units. The fragments are reassembled at the final destination. And, and again, because what's really fragmented is the payload, what we're really talking about is reassembling the original bundles payload from the payloads of the fragmentary blocks. Uh, they're reassembled at the final destination to reconstitute the original payload, and that, that original payload is then delivered. And so the application never sees frag fragmentary bundles and it receives fractional payloads. It sees the entire uh, payload that was sent by the source node uh, following reassembly, and that, that must follow uh, reception of all of the fragmentary bundles. Earlier, I mentioned endpoint IDs that are carried in the primary block of the bundle. The sources and destinations of bundles are endpoints. They are identified by endpoint IDs that are functionally similar to IP addresses. Uh, the important difference there is that, uh, as, as we discussed a little bit in the previous session of, of, the, of this course, uh, bundle protocol endpoint IDs are names, they're not addresses. They don't have any topological significance. They cannot because the expectation is that the traversal of a, a single bundle through the network might take so long because of outages and, and, and so on, that the topological location of the destination might change while the bundle is in flight. So what we do instead is what's called late binding. We, we only send the bundle to the final destination from a node that is proximate to the, the final node and that is able to uh, know the topological location of the destination node at that time. The bundle endpoint ID must not be interpreted as something that tells you what the route is that the bundle will take. It can't be interpreted as indicating where the destination is. They are uniform record identifiers. That is the, the, the names that, that comprise 
schemes, scheme names, and scheme specific parts. And there's lots of different possible scheme names for um, DTN endpoint IDs. The one that is defined in RFC 5050 is the scheme named uh, DTN. So a, den, a, 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 a typical endpoint ID might look like DTN colon, and that's DTN being the scheme name, and then colon, and then the scheme specific part for the DTN scheme is of the format slash slash, and then um, usually a, uh, a, a, a DNS name, followed by a, a, a demultiplexing uh, token, a DMUX, such as uh, mail in this case. DTN is not the only scheme that can be used for transmission of, of uh, bundles uh, through a delay tolerant networking. There's an alternative scheme named IPN, IPN standing for Interplanetary Network, uh, which is uh, designed to be potentially uh, much more bandwidth efficient in transmission. The IPN scheme uniform record identifiers are of the format, uh, the, the name IPN, colon, and then two numbers, a uh, node number that uniquely identifies the node and uh, a service number that acts like a port number um, and separated by a, uh, by a single period. The advantage of this scheme is that because it's, it's a fixed format with just two numbers in it, you can abbreviate this uh, character string uh, to a single pair of unsigned binary integers using a technique called compressed bundle header encoding. And that can shrink the primary block uh, dramatically instead of having uh, a multiple fairly lengthy character strings, you know, URIs, uh, embedded in the primary block as source destination and, and for a couple of other purposes as well, we instead just have uh, pairs of binary integers, each of which might only be a single byte. Um, so IPN scheme bundle endpoint IDs uh, look a little bit like internet addresses because they have numbers and, and dots and so forth in them, but they're still just names. They happen to be names written in a very constrained alphabet that is all numbers instead of letters, but they only identify the destination endpoint and source endpoint. They don't say where it is. They uh, are roughly analogous to uh, TCP uh, and, and UDP um, in, uh, IP addresses and, and port numbers, but then the analogy breaks down when you start looking at the utility of TCP and, and UDP IP addresses in routing because that, that utility is absent in the case of IPN um, uh, endpoint IDs. Notice that the node numbers in CBHE conformant IPN scheme endpoint IDs uh, identify nodes and nodes in bundle protocol are uh, software entities with state machines that, that execute the bundle protocol. Um, because in, um, in operations, we very often have uh, multiple protocols that are co-resident on the same uh, hardware, on the same uh, piece of, of, of uh, uh, internet device, uh, so that the protocol stack operations can be executed efficiently. Uh, we can expect that the the node numbers that identify BP nodes could also be used to identify endpoints at other layers of the protocol stack. Uh, not all DTN implementations do this, but ION is in, in part based on the concept that the BP node numbers identify not only BP nodes, but also the um, engines that are the endpoints of LTP, uh, the entities that are the endpoints of CFTP, uh, the um, continua that are the endpoints of the remote AMS adaptation of the asynchronous message service. So uh, by convention within ION, and again, not in all implementations of, of DTN, 
the same numerical value is uh, used for uh, BP, for a, a BP node number. Uh, it's also used as the uh, engine number of an LTP engine used by that BP node, uh, the entity number of the CFTP entity that uses that BP node, uh, likewise the continuum number of an AMS continuum that uses that BP node. As we mentioned in the previous segment of the course, DTAN was designed with security in mind from the very first day. There is no separate security protocol, uh, no separate layer of security uh, protocol in the DTN architecture. Uh, security is built directly into BP as extension blocks. Every block of a bundle can be signed by uh, a bundle integrity block that uh, enables any detection of that enables detection of any tampering with with block data. That is, uh, for each block of the bundle, there can be an extension block, a bundle integrity extension block, that can carries a signature that of the, computed over the uh, referenced block, so that you can, uh, as the receiver, uh, recompute that signature and make sure that it matches what was attached to the bundle at the time the bundle was created. Uh, when there is a, a bundle integrity block for the primary block, which identifies the source node, then you can verify the authenticity of the bundle. You, you know who it was that, that sent the bundle, which can be uh, very helpful in a lot of uh, security contexts. Uh, every block other than the primary block can uh, additionally be encrypted using a block con confidentiality block. And what, what happens there is that the uh, block confidentiality block is an, uh, an additional extension block that contains uh, key material that you can use to decrypt the uh, block that is encrypted uh, when a block confidentiality block is attached to a bundle, it references some other block that it then encrypts in place so that that uh, encrypted block uh, passes through the network uh, in, in anonymous fashion. Nobody can look at it until the bundle reaches its final destination and the uh, en encryption key can be used to decrypt the, uh, the, the encrypted block. Um, the block integrity block and block confidentiality block themselves are uh, not helpful in defending against traffic analysis because the primary block cannot be encrypted because if it were, it, it would be impossible to forward the data through the network the forwarding nodes wouldn't be able to uh, figure out what the destination is. But there is a uh, defense against traffic analysis, uh, provided that there is some portion of the network that is, uh, that is known to be safe uh, at, the, at the boundary between the safe portion of, of the network and, and the unsafe portion, you can uh, encapsulate the entire original bundle inside inside a, an encapsulating bundle and then encrypt the entire original bundle as the payload of the encapsulating bundle and, and, and send that encapsulating bundle through the hazardous part of the network where uh, traffic analysis is not uh, a concern. And when it emerges from that hazardous part of the, of the network, the encrypted um, uh, payload can be decrypted, the uh, encapsulated original bundle can be extracted and forwarded uh, in the safe portion of the network with its primary block in the clear. The Licklider transmission protocol is a convergence layer transport protocol uh, that's designed to be used over space links. It has uh, some of the same functionality of uh, TCP, but, but is very different in the way it operates uh, and in the specifics of, of, of the service that you get from it. LTP divides a data block, uh, which might contain a, a high layer uh, protocol data unit, usually a bundle, but it can be something else. You can use LTP for, for purposes other than, than sending bundles. Uh, divides that, that data block into individual segments for transmission 
and forwards those segments through the network. Like TCP, it detects uh, transmission failure at the granularity of, of segments. And so the retransmission of uh, data that are found to be uh, missing or corrupted is at segment granularity rather than uh, the granularity of, of the entire uh, higher layer protocol data unit. That is, LTP automatically retransmits lost segments as necessary and reassembles the segments into the original block at the receiver. Um, unlike TCP, LTP transmits segments for multiple blocks concurrently. There is uh, a good reason for that, which is that uh, in, in order for TCP to uh, provide the in-order uh, delivery service that it does with uh, no uh, missing data and no duplications, uh, any lost data or, or uh, corrupted data uh, w will prevent the delivery of uh, all previously received data until that hole is, is fixed. In end-to-end -end communications in the internet, that works fine because the round trip times are very short. Uh, over um, signal propagation delays of 20 minutes, that 20 minute round uh, uh, 40 minute round trip time would defer delivery of any of the previously received data until uh, the, the hole in the data had been repaired by retransmission. And uh, that would be a, a waste of uh, 40 minutes of, um, of rare uh, network connectivity. Uh, instead, what we will do with, with LTP is when there are uh, when there are errors found in the received data, we send back a report that says there's something missing, but we continue receiving data and reassembling data as possible. And uh, the and, and it, it's made it's entirely possible for an entire uh, block to be uh, transmitted and received uh, before previously transmitted uh, blocks are received because the retransmission of lost data for those earlier blocks may have delayed reassembly of the blocks and delivery of the blocks. Um, so that means that the data that are sent by LTP will not necessarily arrive in transmission order. And there is no suppression of duplicate data arrival. So the services you get from LTP are not the same as the services you get from TCP. Uh, the in order without duplication, without error service that you get from TCP is uh, very convenient for a large number of applications. Uh, the uh, very long round trip times in DTN make providing that service uh, inefficient in, uh, in, in most applications, most environments. And, and so LTP is not designed to provide that service. Um, LTP has uh, a notion of uh, red and green data. The, a single LTP block begins with uh, red data that are uh, checked for uh, loss and uh, are retransmitted when loss is detected. Uh, and green data, which we can think of as being um, um, UDP uh, the equivalent of UDP for uh, for LTP. Uh, there's no loss detection in the, the green data portion of a block. Um, there is no no transmission of red data following uh, uh, green data. Uh, all the red data of a block gets sent first, gets retransmitted as necessary. The green data arrives after that, and uh, and will wait for the red data to arrive. So LTP provides reliable transmission. Uh, you can get reliable transmission at a layer higher in the stack. The custody transfer mechanism in bundle protocol that we'll talk about a little bit later will retransmit uh, lost data. Uh, but the unit of retransmission at the bundle layer is the entire bundle rather than an individual segment. And so if you have a very large bundle um, and, and you have a, a, a one-bit loss, you may end up retransmitting 
uh, 200 megabytes of data instead of a single LTP segment that might be only um, 100 bytes long. So it's a more efficient use of transmission bandwidth. There are uh, a number of implementations of the DTN core protocols, and we'll um, survey a few of those uh, here before we uh, get into a discussion of ION. Uh, the DTN2 implementation, uh, written in C and C++, uh, was the uh, original reference architecture for delay-tolerant networking. Uh, it um, was developed by the um, University of California, Berkeley, uh, working from the uh, bundle protocol specification, RFC 5050. Uh, and it also includes implementations of some supporting protocols, uh, including a uh, liquid transmission protocol. Uh, it is the uh, software that the uh, European uh, Networking for Communication in Challenged Communities, uh, N4C, uh, project uh, uses. Uh, it is also uh, the implementation that is used uh, at the um, uh, ground station at the Huntsville Operations Center for um, International Space Station operations. Uh, it includes a uh, mail application, uh, an HTML uh, requesting application. Uh, it includes uh, some um, uh, platform adaptation tools. Uh, it includes an implementation of PROFIT, which is a uh, DTN routing protocol based on uh, opportunistic uh, forwarding. Uh, it's uh, designed to be used in um, uh, terrestrial delay tolerant networking uh, applications and is uh, widely used in, in DTN research. It's highly portable. Uh, it's based on the QT cross-platform network, so it runs on Windows, Linux, OS X, embedded, embedded Linux, Symbian. Uh, it's included in the DTN2 distribution along with applications and tools, uh, and it in includes um, a, uh, uh, a not-so-instant messaging uh, application uh, and uh, uh, a uh, software tool for analyzing field test traces of profit routing activity. Um, another um, implementation that has been uh, available for many years now is called Postulation, uh, developed by a Canadian company called Via Genie. Uh, Postulation is a, a DTN implementation that runs on Windows, Mac OS, um, Linux, BSD, RTEMS, designed for easy installation and instant registration to the, what's called the DTN bar, an experimental uh, network for uh, DTN research. Uh, it implements bundle protocol uh, and uh, is especially intended to be uh, uh, very easy to install so that researchers can get involved in DTN research uh, very rapidly. It includes uh, applications, uh, uh, ping and, and, and pong uh, applications, uh, send and receive functions for sending and receiving uh, files, uh, an HTTP, HTTPS proxy, and a, uh, a news service delivery that uh, can be used uh, in the same way as, uh, as uh, IP-based uh, RSS. IBR DTN is an implementation of RFC 5050 developed at the Technical University of Braunschweig in Germany. Uh, it implements RFC 5050, some supporting protocols. It's written in C++. It is uh, designed uh, to run on embedded systems using the OpenWRT platform. So uh, the, the kinds of applications it's designed for are, are essentially routers in particular, things like router board 532A. Um, but it can be used more generally as a framework for DTN applications. And there's uh, a very capable uh, uh, port of uh, IBR DTN on, um, on Android so that it can be uh, used from uh, smartphones. Um, the uh, architecture has multiple interfaces, so it's easy to change um, functionalities. The, the uh, structure is highly modular. Uh, it includes applications such as uh, DTN send, DTN receive, 
uh, DTN trigger, DTN ping, trace path, uh, inbox and outbox, uh, stream. Uh, it has built into it support for the TCP and IP protocols at, at uh, the convergence layer. Uh, it includes the original bundle security protocol, uh, not the more recent streamlined bundle protocol, protocol that uh, is being used uh, in uh, uh, current uh, distributions of ION. Uh, it includes the IPND neighbor discovery uh, that um, enables uh, nodes that come into proximity, proximity with one another to uh, open uh, connections and uh, start uh, uh, routing data through one another. Uh, the intent of the implementation is to be extremely portable. It's been tested on um, uh, x86 and MIPS and Raspberry Pis and BeagleBones, various ARM platforms, um, multiple Linux distributions, OSX, uh, and uh, the source code and the packages for the various distributions are available as open source. The JDTN implementation is uh, a DTN implementation written uh, by Cisco in Java. Uh, it contains a, a, a DTN core that implements bundle protocol and uh, LTP. It runs on any platform that supports Java, such as uh, uh, Android. It also contains a set of user interfaces for Android and was developed mostly for mobile platforms. So with all of these implementations of DTN available, why is there ION? Why not use one of these uh, other well-supported uh, implementations for space communications? And the answer uh, is a, it's a there's a three-part answer. I have, I have three slides talking about this. The answer is that there are constraints on communication in the space flight environment that make it uh, difficult to use implementations that are not designed for that environment uh, successfully in flight communications. Uh, the first class of constraints we'll talk about here for a second is uh, link constraints. And, and there, um, the, the wireless links that are the foundation for interplanetary network communications uh, are generally much slower than the kinds of links that you can um, expect to be running on the internet or in terrestrial environments. Uh, and they're usually uh, highly asymmetric. Uh, the part of the reason for that is that there's limited electrical power. So um, the, the, the power that you can put into transmitters is typically limited. Uh, the uh, antennae that are used for transmission are uh, relatively small compared to the vast distances between nodes in interplanetary space. So the signals are uh, weak. This is historically limited transmission from the spacecraft to rates on the order of up to six megabits per second. That's, that's beginning to change. There are uh, higher speed uh, communication options um, being developed um, in the last few years that uh, contemplate transmission on the order of gigabits per second, uh, even from the moon in a few years. Uh, for the outer planets, uh, the data rates are expected still to remain uh, quite low. So there will still be a need to support communications over environments that have uh, very uh, minimal power in the uh, in the communication links. Um, because the antennae on spacecraft are typically small, uh, the their sensitivity for reception is also very limited. So even if the spacecraft is able to transmit it at high data rates, it won't be able to receive data at particularly high data rates. The rates of transmission to the spacecraft have historically been even lower than the, the data rates uh, transmitted from spacecraft, uh, much lower, orders of magnitude lower, on the order of just uh, one or 2,000 uh, bits per second. That also is uh, changing. Higher rates are possible, but not, um, uh, not vastly higher. We're still not looking at uh, gigabits per second of uh, transmission to spacecraft. 
what that means is that the cost uh, is a dollar cost per octet of data on the links is high and the links are heavily subscribed because spacecraft are out there to perform uh, science investigations uh, and the purpose of the spacecraft is to get as much science data back as possible so the the, the links are uh, typically as uh, are used as heavily as possible so economical use of reception and transmission opportunities is especially important for spaceflight communications. The, the second class of constraints on DTN communication in, in the space flight environment uh, would be processor constraints. Again, we have limited electrical power. Uh, there's also limited uh, mass allowance for uh, flight computers. Uh, and the radiation environment is intense. And what that means is that you have to do something about hardening the flight computer against that radiation. Um, radiation hardening a flight computer is um, a, a time consuming uh, and expensive proposition and the market for it is small. So the, uh, the, the, the mass production of radiation hardened flight computers is not really in the cards. It, the, they're, they're developed on, in, in small numbers and so uh, the economies of scale are not there so the cost of developing and hardening these flight computers is amortized over a smaller uh, number of machines so the machines are expensive. So they're expensive and, um, and typically always slower than engineering workstations because the, again, the market is slow for these things. The, uh, the, the investments in processor technology typically go to mass markets where they'll be able to sell millions of units. So the cost per processing cycle is high and the processors are heavily subscribed. And so economical use of the processing resources is also extremely important in um, spaceflight delay tolerant networking. The third general class of constraints on uh, DTM communications in spaceflight are operation constraints. And, and those may in fact be even more severe in the long run than the constraints on bandwidth and, and processor power. Um, because these uh, spacecraft are um, robotic, there are no uh, crewed spacecraft in, in deep space uh, in, in the near future. Um, hands-on repair of devices, hands-on repair of software uh, is impossible. You, so the, the software and hardware need to be as reliable as possible. Predictability enhances reliability. So flight software usually has to meet hard real-time deadlines. So typically what's used in flight computers is real-time operating systems. Uh, all software uh, for uh, operating the spacecraft runs in kernel mode without memory protection so that it's all uh, uh, swapping out based on um, uh, interrupts and um, with, with, with as little overhead as possible. What, what that means is that dynamic allocation of system memory is contraindicated because it's typically um, not necessarily predictable. And, and so it's typically prohibited except in well understood spacecraft states such as when you boot the flight software. So uh, that means that the software must live within static memory allocations. And that's uh, very different from the software that runs on engineering workstations or Android phones. ION is DTN that is designed for spaceflight. It's designed to address all of the constraints that we were talking about on the three preceding slides. Um, and specifically, uh, it's designed to use reception and transmission contacts as efficiently as possible uh, because the links in spaceflight communications are likely to be uh, relatively slow. They're very expensive. They're highly 
um, subscribed. They're uh, often uh, highly asymmetrical. Uh, it's designed to use processing resources as efficiently as it can because the um, processing power on spacecraft is limited. There are uh, radiation hardened uh, chips that are relatively slow and very expensive. Uh, it's designed to use fixed memory allocation provided at the startup rather than dynamically uh, obtaining memory resources from the operating system as uh, typical uh, workstation software or, or uh, laptop software will do. And uh, it has to be uh, compatible with real-time operating systems, unlike the implementations that run on engineering workstations and um, uh, desktop computers. So in the next session, we'll talk about the architecture of ION and how it responds uh, more specifically to these operational and uh, processing and, and bandwidth constraints. We'll uh, go through the design principles that uh, ION is built on and the resulting structure of the software. Uh, we'll overview the modules of the product and we'll uh, look at the features of, of those modules. The design of ION addresses all the constraints we're talking about uh, in, in these specific ways. There's a built-in private dynamic management system uh, for um, statically allocated uh, memory. That is, at startup, we allocate uh, a, a certain amount of memory to ION in one big chunk, and ION will uh, dot privately do dynamic management of that large chunk of memory. This protects the rest of the flight software from the, uh, the possibility of uh, out of control memory allocation, uh, robbing uh, critical elements of flight software of the memory they need. And yet it provides all of the advantages of uh, dynamic uh, memory management that are so convenient in um, most software that we use every day. Um, there is a mechanism for um, a, a high-speed shared direct access to a, a built-in object database. Uh, ION has its own object database management system, and uh, there is a shared direct access to, to that system using library functions. There is a system-wide transaction mechanism, and that's primarily for safety. It ensures that there is mutual exclusion so that you don't have uh, lockouts when you have uh, shared access to uh, shared memory and, and the object database. It prevents race conditions. And it also enables the reversal of all database updates that are made within a, a single transaction in, in case of software failure. So it's a critical section uh, mechanism that protects data integrity within the object database, uh, preventing things like uh, uh, dangling uh, references that are left when software fails in the middle of uh, updating a, a complex data structure. Um, it's based on a compressed bundle header encoding. Uh, it was the first implementation of DTN that was based on um, a bundle header uh, compression uh, that is made possible by the IPN scheme endpoint IDs. Uh, there is a zero copy object mechanism, and what that does is uh, minimize the storage that's required for uh, for a given uh, data item in ION, and also um, reduce the processing cost of of, of dealing with uh, bundles. Uh, in particular, the uh, essence of this idea is that when a bundle is received, it is placed in one place in the storage of the system. And then as it is passed up and down the protocol stack, instead of making copies of it that are in, bun in uh, buffers that are used by the different layers of protocol, the data just remains in one place and a zero copy object structure is passed up and down the protocol stack, the zero copy object structure just 
containing references to the um, locations in memory and, and possibly the file system where portions of the bundle reside. And the bundles are, are, are not copied from one buffer to another. It's written in C uh, for uh, processing economy and a small footprint. There is as, as little uh, language overhead as possible. Uh, and, and yet it's also uh, portable among um, pretty much all POSIX-based operating systems and, and operating systems that have generally POSIX-like uh, capabilities, including real-time operating systems. So it's, it's portable across Linux, Windows, Android, Solaris, OS X, Artems, uh, VxWorks, FreeBSD. Uh, C makes it possible to have that portability while still retaining uh, high economy in uh, processing and, uh, and, and compact representation of the software. The design principles underlying these accommodations to the constraints that characterize um, DTN communications and spaceflight are, are these. We'll uh, have two slides to discuss these. Um, the first is uh, the use of shared memory. This is making a virtue of necessity. In many environments, if we're using a, a real-time operating system, there may, may not be any support for protected memory, so every bit of memory is shared. We have no option. We have to uh, design to accommodate shared memory. We can turn that requirement into an advantage. Shared memory is an extremely efficient way of passing data between flight software tasks, uh, as long as you're careful. And that's the fundamental design principle um, that uh, uh, ION is based on. This general uh, uh, mechanism is, is illustrated here. There's a, uh, this, this pattern is repeated in, in many, many places in the design of ION. Uh, you've got um, a, a sending element of software that wants to send some data to a receiving element of software in as efficient a way as possible, the uh, data resides somewhere in, in storage and you just want to pass a uh, reference to the, that, that element of data. And so what the, what the sender will do is place that, that reference in a linked list in shared memory. It has to do that in a way that uh, is uh, safe, that present, prevents some uh, uh, race conditions and, and lockouts. And so what it will do is it'll take a, a mutex semaphore that protects the linked list in shared memory. And, and in doing so, it'll wait until that uh, linked list is, is available and the, the mutex has been given. Um, once it has taken that mutex, and it will lock the mutex. It'll then enqueue the reference to data uh, into the linked list. It'll unlock the mutex and then it'll give a second semaphore, which is uh, a signaling semaphore saying uh, data are available uh, to retrieve from this linked list. The corresponding receiver will uh, first uh, take that, uh, th that signaling semaphore. It's waiting on that signaling semaphore, waiting for something to be in the linked list. And as soon as it's informed that the linked list is not empty, it will um, lock the mutex so that it has exclusive access to the linked list, waiting, of course, until uh, the sender unlocks it. Then it will remove data from the linked list, and then it'll unlock the mutex so that the sender can place more data in the linked list. Uh, typically, the receiver will operate in a loop where once it has uh, locked the list, it will uh, empty the, the list, it'll uh, dequeue everything that's in it. Another key design principle is um, zero copy objects, zero copy procedures. The intent there is to leverage shared memory to minimize the processing overhead. And so uh, what we do as data are passed uh, up and down the protocol stack in um, protocol headers and trailers is uh, pass up and down the stack instead of the data itself, just accounting structures 
that have pointers to headers and trailers and to the core data that are at the at the, the, the base of, of the uh, protocol data units. What this means is that the same data object can be shared by multiple tasks, as long as you have reference counting that prevents premature deletion of the data. And uh, data never need to be copied from the buffer of one layer of protocol into the buffer of, of another layer. When you remove uh, a, uh, a header or a trailer, all you're doing is deleting uh, elements of a, a linked list structure that includes pointers to the headers and trailers of the uh, different um, protocol data units at different layers of the stack uh, without uh, ever needing to copy anything. And, and finally, uh, portability. Because this is an unfamiliar programming model, it's actually quite challenging to develop new software in the VxWorks environment, for example. So portability is important. We make it as easy as possible to develop software in an environment with good programming support, such as Linux, and then deploy that software without changing it at all in the target uh, RTOS environment. Here, in a nutshell, is the entire ION bundle protocol implementation in a simplified form. The uh, basis for everything is this object database that is in shared memory or, or shared resources, maybe partly memory, partly file system. And what we're showing in these rectangles is uh, uh, processes or tasks that are running in parallel as, as daemon tasks running continuously. Uh, in inside the object database, these circles represent linked lists that are protected by uh, mutexes in the same way we we're showing them uh, a couple of slides ago. And what will happen is that the application will um, issue some data that need to be sent to another um, application on, on some other node, some uh, remote endpoint. Um, Issuing app, uh, application data will result in a bundle being created and appended to a linked list here that is feeding into a routing daemon. The routing daemon will dequeue the bundles that are queued up for forwarding in this list, determine the routes for those bundles uh, for each bundle it will infer from the route which of the topologically adjacent nodes to send the bundle to directly, and then append the bundle to the link list that is dedicated to transmission to that topologically adjacent node, that neighboring node. Um, the, the sender daemon for transmission to that neighboring node is waiting on the arrival of uh, data into this linked list, and when data arrive here, it dequeues these bundles from this list and uh, uses convergence layer protocols to transmit them to receiver daemons on other nodes, or in this case, uh, a receiver daemon on the same node, because here we're showing, for simplicity, we're showing loopback uh, transmission of a bundle. So we have a sender daemon, a convergence layer output daemon, and a receiver or convergence layer input daemon running concurrently on the same node. The sender transmits the bundle, the receiver receives it using convergence layer protocols, and the receiver then calls a function that dispatches the bundle. A single bundle always has a, a single destination endpoint, but because of the nature of endpoints, there might be multiple members of the endpoint, the multiple nodes in the endpoint. And so it's possible for the bundle to be uh, delivered locally and or uh, further forwarded to the final destination node. Um, either of those is possible or both. Uh, in the case of uh, forwarding, the dispatch bundle is appended to the same queue of uh, bundles that are pending routing as, um, as would 
be used for issuing new data. In the case of the, the destination being the receiving node, um, dispatch function will enqueue the data onto a, a list that a thread of the application is waiting on when data are delivered here onto this linked list. The application's um, delivery function will dequeue the data from the linked list, pass it to the application, and the application will act on it. The design goals for ION are, are these, uh, and, and there, there's nothing very surprising here. Uh, ION is designed to reliably convey data over a delay tolerant network. Um, based on that capability, there are a number of uh, particular uh, functions that we'd like to be able to support, uh, reliable data streaming, uh, reliable file delivery, um, reliable distribution of short messages, uh, asynchronous message service to multiple recipients of a published subscribe system, um, inexpensive management of traffic through the net network, it should be um, easy and relatively inexpensive to uh, keep the network running all the time. It should be as autonomous as possible. Inexpensive facilities for monitoring the performance of the network. Uh, robustness against node failure. Uh, portability across heterogeneous computing platforms, as, as we talked about a moment ago. Um, high speed and low overhead so that it's suitable for operation in the spaceflight environment. Uh, and easy integration with a heterogeneous underlying communication infrastructure. That is, we, we want the convergence layer adaptation layer to uh, simplify the insertion of uh, a wide variety of convergence layer protocols into the ION stack. ION is made up of a handful of major software modules uh, each of which contains uh, libraries and uh, daemon processes that uh, accomplish the objectives of, of that module. Um, the, the modules that you're most likely to care about in the course of, of working with ION are, are these. Uh, first would naturally be the bundle protocol module, which is a, an implementation of bundle protocol. Uh, also LTP, uh, an implementation of um, of a core DTN protocol that provides much of the same capability as uh, TCP, but does it over uh, potentially uh, very long round trip times. Uh, datagram retransmission is an alternative implementation of LTP that's designed to be used in the internet. It has uh, congestion control and reliability features built into it that make it uh, compatible with internet uh, requirements. Uh, but its uh, protocol data units are the protocol data units of LTP. Uh, ICI is uh, interplanetary communication infrastructure. That's a set of general purpose libraries that provide common functionality uh, to, to the other modules. And this is where implementations of uh, zero copy objects and the um, object database and so forth reside. CFTP, this is ION's implementation of the CCSS file delivery protocol, which is a, an application layer service for, for file transfer that um, provides, in particular, um, a lot of uh, capability for uh, packaging file data with metadata and, and doing uh, segmentation and uh, reassembly of files um, that uh, may be sent over multiple paths of the network uh, to take advantage of available bandwidth. Uh, AMS, the asynchronous message service, an application layer service that uses DTN protocols for uh, publish subscribe of short messages up to 64,000 bytes. Uh, bundle streaming service is a system for, for efficient data streaming over a delay tolerant network. This may uh, seem um, like an oxymoron, but the, the streaming applications that are important in spaceflight operations are uh, compatible with delay tolerant networking. Um, streaming that is conversational, no, not so much. We're not going to run Skype over DTN very well. But um, streaming video, 
where it happens to take 20 minutes uh, of, of elapsed time from the, the moment that a frame is captured to the moment it's viewed is um, uh, perfectly feasible in DTN and is supported by the bundle streaming service. A few words about standards compliance in ION. The base bundle protocol uh, and LTP specifications were developed by the Internet Research Task Force Delay Tolerant Networking Research Group. Um, the Consultative Committee for Space Data Systems produced profiles of the BP and uh, LTP specifications, and those profiles are published in CCSDS recommended standards or blue books. Uh, and those are standardized for use by CCSDS member agencies. The profiles are interoperable with the base specifications, uh, but they are in some cases um, uh, somewhat constrained so that they can um, be efficient enough to work in the space environment. Uh, there also are some extensions to the protocols for the same sort of purpose, such as the extended class of service mechanisms in uh, BP, which are not standardized within uh, the internet um, research or engineering task forces yet. The ION uh, BP and LTP code conforms to the CCSDS blue books and is available as open source from SourceForge. We'll now go through those modules in detail, looking at them more closely. Uh, here is a general overview of the, uh, the modules and how one depends on another. Uh, the notation here is that uh, the modules that are higher in this diagram are uh, dependent on the ones on underlying them. So, for example, bundle protocol and LTP uh, rely on the capabilities provided by SDR, uh, zero copy object, ZCO, and SMRBT. SDR is the spacecraft data recorder system that manages the object database. Uh, SMRBT is uh, shared memory red black trees, um, high speed um, in memory uh, uh, data structures for uh, data lookup. Uh, corresponding to the SMRBTs are uh, slower but um, simpler SM list structures that uh, SDR uses extensively. Um, all of those things, uh, SDR, SM list, zero, zero copy objects, and, and SMRBT rely on the capabilities of the PSM personal space management system, which uh, is uh, ION's um, system for dynamic management of uh, memory that is in a pre-allocated uh, static memory partition. And then uh, platform underlying all of those things would be the, um, uh, the adaptation layer that provides portability across multiple operating systems. There's lots of if defs in there and, um, and, and um, implementations of uh, missing pieces for um, a common um, access uh, to the same functionality across all operating systems. The bundle protocol module uh, is a full implementation of the bundle protocol specification as developed by the DTN research group. Uh, there is support for prioritization of data flows. That's uh, three general layers of uh, class of service. Um, uh, fragmentation and, and reassembly from fragments. Um, flexible status reporting. Uh, that is, uh, there are mechanisms built into BP for sending status reports as a bundle makes its way through the network. Uh, the uh, BP module in, uh, in ION fully supports that mechanism. Uh, custody transfer, the uh, ability to um, request that a receiving node acknowledge receipt of each bundle and um, and notify the, the the sender of the bundle so that the sender can release um, the storage resources devoted to to that bundle. And there are additional features that are uh, that go beyond RFC fifty fifty. Uh, there's a rate control system that provides support for uh, congestion forecasting and congestion avoidance. 
there are uh, the mechanisms for uh, bundle header compression, uh, CVAG, which are not in RFC 5050, they're in a, a separate uh, RFC, uh, to reduce particle overhead and improve link utilization. And there's an implementation of something called contact graph routing, which is a system for uh, dynamic route computation over um, interplanetary links that are uh, not uh, continuous. There are a number of compile time options for IONS implementation of bundle protocol that can change the functionality of BP in, in various ways. Uh, there's a, an ION deployment guide that explains all of these things in some detail. You can do things like, for example, um, turn on or, or turn off um, inter interplanetary multicast, uh, a feature of uh, bundle protocol in ION that is, uh, goes beyond the current published standards. Uh, likewise, uh, uh, something called uh, BPACS, which is uh, aggregate custody signaling that is a more efficient implementation of uh, custody transfer. And there are a number of other uh, capabilities like these that can be enabled and, and disabled or tuned using compile time options. Uh, there are, um, an, and this is a, a general structural feature of all the, the modules in, in ION, there are uh, administration mechanisms for configuring each of the modules uh, at a particular node uh, in the network. Um, the administration um, uh, commands are executed by an administration command uh, uh, utility program. Um, and in, in the case of BP, there are a number of those. There's a, a general BP admin utility program that executes the commands that are provided in um, a, a BPRC file. Uh, this is a general configuration of BP on a given node. Um, there are specific administration tasks that are performed for uh, the IPN scheme itself. Uh, the commands there are in an IPNRC file. And this is for configuring static and default routes for uh, endpoints whose uh, IDs conform to the IPN scheme. And likewise, there's a, a DTN scheme administration command um, analogous uh, to, to the IPN scheme administration command. This is, this is a, it's called DTN2 admin, and this is for configuring default and static routes for DTN scheme endpoints. When you're uh, testing BP applications, the, uh, when you're testing BP installations, there are a number of executables that are uh, provided um, as part of uh, ION. There's a, a, a pair of applications called BP driver and BP counter for uh, sending and receiving um, a continuous stream of bundles and, uh, and counting them and measuring uh, throughput. Uh, BP echo is a, a bundle receiver that uh, simply uh, echoes the bundles that it receives. The BP source and BP sync are a pair of uh, very simple uh, test programs that uh, you can use to m make sure that uh, the configuration of your node is correct, that uh, uh, just for, for testing out whether or not uh, data can uh, flow between nodes in your network. Uh, there's a, a BPing uh, test executable that is not listed here that is analogous to the uh, ping uh, utility in the internet. Licklider transmission protocol likewise is a full implementation of the LTP specification as developed by the DTN research group um, documented in RFC 5326 uh, and also like BP IONS implementation of LTP includes some other features that go beyond what's uh, called out in the specification itself. Um, one of those is uh, a block structure, that is, the aggregation of multiple service data units, such as bundles, into a single block. That aggregation uh, enables you to control the rate at which reports are returned to the sending node, in this case probably the spacecraft, 
um, by uh, limiting the number of blocks to be a, a number that corresponds to the uh, number of report acknowledgments that can comfortably be transmitted over over uplink uh, bandwidth and the uh, the size of the blocks can be set to a, a, th a threshold such that um, uh, a, a large bundle will go into a single block, a large number of small bundles will go into a single block, and the rate at which acknowledgments go to the spacecraft will be more or less constant. Uh, a second innovation in uh, ION's implementation of LTP is uh, implementation of a, a very coarse-grained delay-tolerant uh, flow control mechanism that is non-conversational. It, it accomplishes this by inserting a, a, a limit to the number of concurrent blocks that can be in transmission at any time. If uh, the uh, data rate is uh, such that um, large numbers of errors are occurring, uh, the number of new blocks that can be initiated is uh, limited, and so uh, the source of the data has to back off and wait for uh, some of these errors to be corrected by retransmission before starting new blocks. It's a uh, again, it's a very coarse-grained uh, mechanism, but it's a flow control mechanism that doesn't depend on signaling from the receiving uh, LTP engine. This slide is meant to give you an idea of just how LTP works. Uh, in this example, we've got a sending LTP client, an application, uh, which might be bundle protocol, uh, that sends a, a transaction request uh, internally within the uh, node that, that the sending LTP client and, and its corresponding LTP engine are both housed. That request goes to the sending LTP engine, which proceeds to then take that request, um, which cites a, a, a block of data, uh, a uh, part of which is red, part of which is green. It will chop up the red portion of that data and send it in uh, these red segments to the receiving LTP engine. Um, the green portion of the data then is sent in these green segments. What we're showing here is that the uh, third uh, red segment that is uh, sent from the sending LTP engine to the receiving LTP engine is flagged as a checkpoint. And in response to that, the receiving engine will send back a report segment saying, uh, out of what you've sent me so far, here's how much I received. Uh, the sending LTP engine will send a report acknowledgement back intermingled with the other segments that it's transmitting uh, back to the receiving LTP engine. And, and then uh, we're showing here uh, um, two more uh, data segments and then a final segment, which is uh, a, a checkpoint and also the end of the red part of the data. But this um, explosion here indicates that this is a, a lost segment, the, the, the segment that contains the flag saying I'm a checkpoint and I'm the end of red part is lost in transmission. Um, the receiving LTP engine doesn't receive it, so it doesn't respond to it. And meanwhile, the green segments are transmitted. Here's one that gets all the way through. This one gets lost. Here's one that says uh, end of block. This is the end of the transmission. Um, there's a timer involved here, that is the sending LTP engine upon sending the end of red part uh, um, checkpoint segment uh, expected to receive a report segment, it didn't get it, and so after the uh, appropriate length of time it will automatically retransmit that checkpoint and end of red part segment. Uh, this time it goes all the way through, the receiving engine gets it, passes back uh, a report segment, and there's a corresponding report acknowledgement that comes out. Meanwhile, uh, as this is going on, there's also interchange between the sending LTP engine and its client. Uh, the client send in a transaction request. The sending engine sends uh, an indication back saying, I've started transmission, uh, a, a later indication saying that the initial transmission finished, and, and then finally down here, 
uh, upon receipt of this final report segment, it says the transmission session is complete. Um, at the receiving end, the arrival of the first segment of data in this block at the receiving LTP engine will cause it to send its receiving LTP client uh, an indication saying that there's a new session that has started, data is, is starting to arrive for this block. Um, down here, uh, there, there will be individual indications for each of the green uh, segments that arrive so that the receiving client can make whatever use it can out of those uh, green data items. And then at the end, upon receiving the checkpoint and um, end of red part segment, the receiving LTP engine will pass on to the receiving LTP client a red part reception completed indication so that the receiving client can then take the data that, that arrived in the, the red part of that block and start acting on it. So a few things to keep in mind as you're running LTP within ION for uh, mission operations. Um, LTP is based on the transmission of multiple blocks concurrently so that you're not wasting time waiting for a report before starting transmission of the next block. Uh, there will be multiple block transmission sessions in various stages of completion at the same time. To maximize link utilization, there's no requirement to wait for one session to complete before starting the next one. This is what enables that coarse-grained flow control mechanism I mentioned earlier. The maximum number of transmission sessions that can be concurrently managed by LTP, in this sense, constitutes a transmission window. Um, once the limit is reached, once you've filled up that window, no new transmission can be started at the sending end until one of the existing uh, in-progress sessions completes or is canceled. Uh, if you allow too few concurrent sessions, then you may waste bandwidth. You could uh, essentially be imposing an artificial constraint on link utilization. Uh, if you allow too many concurrent sessions, you could end up with multiple LTP blocks left incomplete at the end of a communication pass. So it's important to configure the aggregation size limits and session count limits of, of the spans, the, the connections between LTP engines uh, during LTP initialization. The mechanism for doing this is the uh, LTP admin utility program, which consumes a file of uh, LTPRC um, commands. Those are documented in the LTPRC uh, man page. There are uh, a number of other daemon processes to be aware of um, when LTP is running. Um, there's an LTP clock background daemon, uh, which triggers the LTP events that are based on the passage of time, such as segment retransmissions. Uh, there's an LTP meter block management daemon. That's the thing that aggregates um, multiple uh, service data units into blocks and then segments the blocks so that um, the segments can be uh, transmitted using underlying link service protocols. And this is really, in essence, what, what affects LTP flow control. It, it won't start a new session, it won't start a new block until uh, the uh, number of available blocks is greater than the number of blocks that are currently in uh, concurrent operation. Uh, the uh, link service input and output tasks underneath LTP, this again follows the same pattern as the convergence layer input and output tasks underneath uh, BP itself, because LTP, just like BP, uh, can run over a variety of uh, underlying uh, link service uh, protocols. Uh, in this case, we're talking here about um, link service adapters for uh, running LTP over UDP IP, which is what we typically do in testing. They uh, handle the transmission of LTP segments encapsulated in UDP datagrams. Uh, the LTP admin uh, utility program starts and stops the LTP clock and LTP meter tasks and the uh, link service input and output tasks. 
there are test tools provided with LTP. Um, LTP driver is a continuous source of LTP segments. LTP counter is a, an LTP block receiver that, that counts blocks as they arrive. A few words on ION's datagram retransmission module. DGR is an alternative implementation of LTP. Uh, the difference between DGR and the LTP that we were discussing just a few minutes ago is that LTP is designed to work in deep space. DGR is actually designed to operate responsibly in the internet. Uh, the protocol data units uh, that, that both of these two systems use are the same, LTP segments. Uh, there are differences in the implementation that make DGR a, a responsible citizen on the internet. DGR was provided uh, originally and, and still primarily as a, as a primary transfer service in support of the asynchronous message service in a non-delay tolerant environment. Uh, there are parts of ION that are non-delay tolerant that uh, benefit from this kind of capability uh, and, and are integrated with the delay tolerant parts. The DGR design combines the LTP concept of concurrent transmission transactions for high bandwidth utilization with congestion control and timeout interval computation algorithms that are adapted from TCP. DGR is one of the smaller ION modules. It includes a couple of test executable programs. Um, a file to DGR will uh, repeatedly read a file of text lines and encapsulate those text lines in uh, DGR LTP segments and uh, send them uh, usually uh, using UDP IP to uh, a corresponding receiver program, DGR to file that receives the text lines, writes them to a file and creating a copy of the original file. Uh, there's also uh, a runtime convergence layer adapter for DGR so that DGR can be used for transmission of bundles, but there are no configuration files and there's no administration utility program for the operation of DGR on an ION node. All of the other modules of ION rely on services provided by an infrastructure element, an infrastructure module called interplanetary communication infrastructure. The ICI module performs these uh, general functions, uh, very, very key functions. It insulates ION software elements from the differences among operating systems. There's a platform uh, module that is an operating system abstraction layer. There is a flexible dynamic private memory management of a fixed pool of pre-allocated system memory, the PSM system that we mentioned earlier. Um, the same structure of uh, flexible dynamic private management uh, is extended to the um, space that's allocated to the object database that is managed by the SDR system. Um, there is uh, a, a support for coexistence of multiple memory management systems. Uh, there is standardized management of um, a, a wide variety of different kinds of linked lists in private and shared memory. There is flexible dynamic private management of a fixed block of non-volatile storage. Uh, um, this could be uh, battery backed memory, it could be pre-allocated file in a flash file system. This is the um, object database managed by the SDR system. And there is um, zero copy object uh, procedures, protocol data encapsulation by reference rather than by copy. Uh, along with a reference counting system to enable safe concurrent access to any single non-volatile storage object by multiple tasks, which is key to the structure and operation of the ION software. So here's a list of the core services, the sub-modules that are included in ICI. Platform is the operating system abstraction layer containing operating system sensitive code that enables ICI to present a single programming interface on all platforms. And that is very much the intent of the ION design is that when you're 
moving from uh, one platform to another, even if they're, they're quite different, uh, the software that uh, operates in, uh, in, in bundle protocol implementation and LTP implementation does not change. Uh, the, uh, all, of, all of that software works the same way on all of the different platforms that ION supports. Uh, PSM is the personal space management system, high-speed dynamic allocation recovery of variable size memory objects inside an assigned memory block of fixed size. So you get the advantages of dynamic memory within the constraints of uh, flight software rules. Uh, Mem Manager is the uh, element that enables multiple memory managers for multiple privately managed blocks of system memory uh, to coexist and, and be concurrently available. Uh, this is not heavily exercised. It's a capability that was built quite a long time ago and, and could conceivably be uh, used for more purposes than it has been so far. The List System, L-Y-S-T, uh, manages doubly linked lists in private memory. Uh, this private memory is uh, memory that is carved out of the shared memory allocation, but it's, um, it, it's operated uh, and, and accessible only to a single uh, task. There's, it's not used for the transmission of data between tasks. <clears throat> the <clears throat> LLCV system implements linked list condition variables. This is a, an inter-thread communication abstraction that integrates POSIX thread condition variables with uh, double linked lists in private memory managed by the, link, the list system. Uh, SMList is a double linked list management service, but this is in shared memory so that um, data can be passed from one task to another using um, SMList and shared memory semaphores. SMRBT is um, a set of mechanisms for populating and navigating red-black trees, which are uh, much faster uh, for, for searching than uh, shared memory lists. Uh, there's uh, the simple data recorder system that manages non-volatile storage, the, the uh, uh, object database that is the basis for uh, data persistence and uh, non-volatile data management in ION. SP Trace is a diagnostic facility that enables uh, performance of both PSM and SDR space management systems. Uh, so it's, it's primarily used nowadays to make sure that there are no leaks in the system. So it's a, uh, a way of detecting uh, resource leaks uh, in a, a manner that's consistent with the way PSM and SDR work, because since there's just a single allocation, Things like Valgrind are not a lot of help in, in looking for, for leaks. There's just been one allocation, it doesn't get lost. Um, zero copy object system, uh, this is uh, leveraging the storage flexibility of SDR and, uh, and, and providing a, a reference counting system. Uh, and IonSec, uh, the Ion Security subsystem, this is a global security service that primarily manages uh, security keys in a security database that is accessible to all the other modules of ION. The files that are used to uh, provide the information that goes into global configuration of the ION protocol stack are uh, listed here. There's a, an ION configuration file that uh, defines the size of um, the um, SDR heap, uh, the size of the PSM uh, working memory region, and, and so on. There are uh, ION administration commands in the INRC file, and there are ION security configuration commands in the ION SEC RC file. Um, the instantiation of ION on a given computer establishes a single ION node on that computer for which the, the hard-coded values of uh, two variables, WM key and SDR name, are used in common by all executables to assure that all elements of the system operate in the same state space. These um, variable names uh, have um, default values, and that's aimed at, at a configuration where you've got just one node running on the machine. It is possible 
to run multiple ion nodes on a single machine without setting up virtual machines or anything like that. You just put each of the nodes in a different directory and give them different names for WM key and different values for WM key and SDR name. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later on in a in a, a, a later module of the uh, course. Uh, the executable programs that are used in operating uh, ICI, there's an ION admin system configuration utility, ION sec admin system security uh, configuration utility. Uh, there's an RFX clock background daemon, same as in BP and LTP, because there are timed events in uh, the operation of some elements of uh, ICI. Uh, there's an SDR mend system repair utility. Uh, there are SDR watch and PSM watch utilities for uh, monitoring resource utilization. Those things uh, typically uh, rely on the information that comes out of the SP trace system. There are test executables provided uh, so to support testing and debugging of, of this uh, module. Um, the file to SDR and SDR to file, you can probably guess, uh, read from a file right into uh, SDR and then read from the SDR, uh, the SDR heap, the object database, and, and write back to a file so that you can uh, watch uh, the operation of the SDR functions. Uh, PSM shell program exercises the PSM system and um, for uh, the shared memory linked list capability there are file to SM and SM to file and SM list SH programs. There's a very powerful DTN simulation system called uh, DTN dev kit that has been developed by Keith Scott of the MITRE Corporation uh, and will be used in the hands-on segments of the course, the first of which starts after this one. Um, Keith will go into the use of the dev kit in much more detail than I can, but I will give you a, a very brief initial overview over the next couple slides, and then we'll leave it at that. The dev kit simulation environment includes a configuration tool written at JPL, uh, and includes a, a set of uh, uh, scenarios using the Common Open Research Emulator. Core uh, provides a set of management functions on top of Windows and, and Linux virtual containers uh, housing the various ION node implementations, including their configurations. And the uh, Linux virtual machine that's part of the package contains the core emulation environment, the ION bundle protocol implementation, and, and these DTN scenarios, which we'll survey in, in just a moment. In ION, scheduled connectivity is controlled by means of a contact plan that controls uh, operation, controls utilization of, of links that are declared by um, mission operators, and those links are utilized by LTP and, and the utilization of those links is um, triggered by the lines of the contact plan. Um, in um, DevKit, the contact plan really drives the operation of the demonstration scenarios. Mobility scripts in core can automatically move nodes, physically move them on the, the screen in the, uh, in the visualization according to predefined paths, and that movement may bring them into and out of contact with other nodes, enabling these links to uh, occur or, or not occur uh, in conformance to the contact plan. It's important to remember there isn't any relationship between uh, the notion of connectivity that is provided by core and the contact plans. There is the, the contact plans declare what should happen in the movement of the nodes and the connectivity, but the contact plans do not drive that connectivity and uh, the connectivity doesn't um, express itself in the contact plans. For scenarios that include changing connectivity, the mobility of the core nodes is orchestrated by scripts to be synchronous with the ION contact plans. 
just some framing remarks on the scenarios that we'll be looking at in a minute. Uh, all of the scenarios included with the development kit will uh, start ION processes on each of the nodes that are built into the scenario and run a BP Echo server on bundle protocol service ID 1 of each node and a BP receive file server on uh, BP service ID 2 of each node. That is, uh, the service ID is the uh, low order portion of the IPN scheme endpoint IDs we talked about earlier. So uh, any node should respond to a bping command of this form uh, where bping is the, the command has um, the keyword bping and then the, the, the uh, ID of the source node, the URI that is the endpoint ID of the source node, um, the URI that is the endpoint ID of the destination node, and um, and then the, 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 that really is sufficient to enable a very simple data exchange between the, the two nodes, the source node and the destination node. You can likewise send a file to any node using a command that looks like this, BP send file, the source, destination, and the, uh, the uh, name of the file. So here's an example BP send file command, IPN 2.5 sending to IPN 3.2 and the name of the file is readme. So here's the first of the scenarios that are provided as part of the dev kit and available for you to run and examine and uh, study and enhance if you want to or, or uh, clone off new scenarios, uh, new simulations from the scripts of of uh, these basic scenarios. Uh, here we've got a, a linear topology and the mobility of the nodes uh, triggers uh, connection and disconnection. So the scripts and the, and the core will automatically start the movement of the satellite into and out of range periodically and will send beeping commands from node two to node four and those commands will uh, reside at, uh, at at the data mule points um, that are uh, disconnected from uh, from the next node in the end to end path. Uh, it will reside there until the node moves into range of the next node in the path, so that it can pass the data forward. The ion contact plan for the scenario is synchronized with the mobility. And, and pings are received whenever the satellite is connected to the fixed network. When the satellite is disconnected, bundles are queued up for later delivery. Here we've got uh, a different scenario. It's a diamond scenario rather than a linear scenario. Uh, and in this scenario, there isn't any movement of the nodes. It's just that the uh, topology changes because the links are uh, turned off, turned back on again. Uh, the connectivity is 50% uh, duty cycles and 180 degrees out of phase. So the uh, traffic will move from uh, from the node at the top to the node at the bottom using the node at the left half the time and the node at the right half the time. Here are three more emulation scenarios that are packaged with the baseline uh, dev kit distribution. On the far left, we see an impedance matching demonstration. You've got a uh, satellite with a high rate downlink to a ground station, for, but for very brief periods of time. Uh, continuous connectivity from the ground station over the terrestrial network, but at a much lower data rate. And so what the ground station is doing is impedance matching between the uh, high rate uh, bursty data coming in from the spacecraft and the low rate continuous flow of data over the terrestrial network. In the middle we see a, a Mars scenario where a rover, a, a mobile uh, robot device on the surface of Mars is uh, essentially shuttling data from a, 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 a disconnected node to a, um, a control center that is able to transmit to Earth by means of the um, DSN stations. The original source of the data 
is not in range of the control center. Uh, the um, rover, the, the mobile rover that is moving between the two, is physically transporting data in its memory as it physically traverses the, the, the surface of Mars, shuttling back and forth between the science instrument that is out of range and the uh, the control center on Mars that can transmit to the DSN stations. Uh, and then on the far right, we see a scenario that is particularly ill-suited to um, the IP uh, architecture. Um, we have a, a LEO satellite communicating with a number of different ground stations. All the ground stations can receive from the satellite, but only two of them can transmit from the satellite. So there's a mix of unidirectional and bidirectional communications that is very difficult to sustain using TCP IP, for example. That wraps it up for this segment of the ION course. Um, in, in this segment, we uh, talked over uh, space communication, uh, the challenges of space communication, and uh, how DTN addresses those more specifically. And then from there, uh, how the ION architecture implements the concepts of the DTN architecture and the more specifically the basic ion structure, the functions of ion, uh, the modules that uh, make up the core of the software product and a brief introduction to the dev kit. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, please send me email. I think my email address is on the first slide of this presentation. Uh, and that's it for now. Thank you, and um, I'll talk to you again after the first hands-on exercise.